UFC Vegas 84. These are the early predictions and the betting breakdown. This card takes place January 13th. Until then, we are on a UFC hiatus. Decided I got to bring the heat with some early predictions for this card. And I'll still be doing content throughout these off weeks. So make sure you keep it locked in here at the MMA Experts channel. Smash that like button if you're new. Subscribe. Turn the post notifications on and make sure to share the video as well. And also note, when we're back at it, January 13th, full card fight companion for UFC Vegas 84 at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Don't miss that fight companion. Let's get into the very early predictions here. Starting the card off, we have Weston Wilson versus Gene Silva. I'm picking Gene Silva. Weston Wilson is the... Little brother of Wonder Boy. Now, they do actually train together, but he looks like a significantly worse version of the Wonder Boy karate style. He's got a very long frame for 145 pounds. He's got the height and reach advantage here. He's upright and tall, and I really think Gene Silva can close the gap with hooks and land some power strikes. Weston Wilson, when he's upright, at times... He reminds me of like the Beverly Hills Ninja Jordan Wright with that chin up in the air to be hit. And Gene Silva is a nasty Muay Thai striker with power. He trains out of fighting nerds. That in itself should be just like an auto pick for the fact that those guys are savages. Specifically an auto pick when it's early in the night prelim fights on the card. I don't think Weston Wilson can keep up. I mean, he has his length and his awkwardness with the karate style. But ultimately, Gene Silva's going to get to him, and he'll finish him. It's also not a good look for Weston Wilson. Taruto Ishihara KO'd him in XMMA, and then he also lost his debut to Joe Anderson Brito, who's an absolute savage, and Gene Silva, a savage, you know, not maybe near the Brito caliber yet, but he's definitely a savage striker with a lot of power. And he beat Vallejos, who was unbeaten on the Contender Series. Like, Gene Silva went out there and picked apart a kid that had a ton of hype on the come up, and I was honestly mega impressed with Gene. So coming in here, taking this fight, it was actually short notice. Gabriel Santos was Weston Wilson's original opponent. I would have picked Gabriel Santos to win. Silva jumps in in the short notice spot, and I think he's going to get a nice win for himself. The odds for the fight here. Wow. Minus 725 Gene Silva, Weston Wilson, plus 525. It opened at minus 350. I'm going to tell you guys this. Minus 725 is stupid. Gene Silva, I really think, is going to pull it off. He'll get the knockout, but he is 5'7". Wilson's 6'1". He's got a 4-inch reach advantage. There's some intangibles that could make this a hard fight. He's an experienced veteran. But yeah, Gene Silva should win. But that minus 715 tag, I hope as we do the updated predictions as we get closer to this card that the line's somewhat thin a bit because that is just unrealistically wide like that's that's untouchable unless you're throwing a heavy parlay together maybe gene silva by knockout we don't have that prop yet i'd assume that's gonna be minus 300 even let's keep running up tom nolan versus nicholas mota this is a straightforward pick nolan by knockout nicholas mota is a bit chinny and he's a guy that's willing to throw himself into the fire and land hard shots to you know bang and crack and some guys will go out but then he also puts himself into spots where he's susceptible to get cracked by bombs nolan viciously knocked out bogdan grad on the dana white's contender series he's six and oh and he has the jalen turner frame at 155 pounds six three 76 inch reach he's gonna starch nicholas moda in a round moda's coming off of a no contest against trey ogden but he lost that fight trey ogden had the arm triangle and it was a, you know, referee flaw error by the ref that screwed his opponent, Trey Ogden, out of a win. It keeps Moda on the roster, though. I don't know if he would have been cut either way. But Tom Nolan is not a good guy to debut against. He's a good kickboxer. He's long as fuck. I think he's going to deliver a bomb on the Moda chin. The length advantage, the fact that Nolan's shown power, he's dangerous. He's a good Aussie prospect. 6'3", 23 years old, and at 155... Yeah, Tom Nolan's going to have a lot of hype. He's going to be a legit prospect on the come up. If he goes out here and performs against Nicholas Moda, you got to keep an eye on Tom. Odds for this fight, Nolan is minus 210, minus 190 even at some spots. Tomoda at plus 160. I was predicting 
before this, okay, Nolan is going to be minus 350 as the favorite. Then when I see the line, minus 190 seems like a steal and a half for Tom Nolan. I know he's only 6-0, and oh, but there's a clear path to beat Nicholas Moda. He's going to be outstruck here. He's going to be knocked out. Tom Nolan by KO. He's going to find the chin. I'm riding with him. KO win. Brutal KO. Next fight on the card, it's Farid Basharat versus Taylor Lapalus. I'm going to ride with Farid Basharat to get the win. I think Taylor Lapalus is pretty good. He's got a very well-rounded MMA game, and I've heard of him for years prior to him entering the UFC. He beat Nate Maness some years ago before Nate even made his UFC debut. But Farid Basharat is the now. I'm riding with Extreme Couture. I think he's going to be too well-rounded. The fact that I know that he can match the striking of Lapalus and then he exceeds him in the wrestling department, I think Farid Basharat is en route to winning a decision and keeping that unbeaten streak alive. I mean, 11-0, last time out, he submitted Clayton Rodriguez, and I thought that was pretty impressive because Clayton's a dangerous and powerful guy, and Farid made it look easy. Lapalus, even though he beat Lauren, I think he kind of struggled in that fight a little bit with Lauren's pressure, and... Basharat to me is way more dynamic than the Irishman Loran. So we're going Basharat to win. I will predict decision though. Looking at the odds, Taylor Lapalus plus 145 is the dog. Fareed Basharat, the minus 170 favorite. I'm feeling good about Basharat getting a hard fought decision. I see him outpointing him over the three rounds. He'll mix in some grappling. I think he could put Lapalus on his back. In his stand-up game, Basharat's being pretty competent. I think he finds shots on the feet. I think it's a mistake, though, for Lapalus to be in this spot because you can build the French bantamweight market well with a guy like Lapalus. Instead, he has to get through a Farid Basharat, Las Vegas native, trains out of there, and a guy who right now I think is surging, him and his brother both, but Farid looks pretty damn good. I think it's a mistake for Lapalus to be in this fight. If the UFC is looking to build Lapalus, which I thought they were going to do because he fought in France. I was like, all right, we can get behind them. Instead, they throw him Basharat 11-0. Someone that I think has a bright future in the game. I'm going to pick Basharat to get it done. Fareed Basharat decision. Next fight on the card, we got Felipe Bunez versus Dennis Bondar. <sighs> coin flip fight i'm gonna pick bondar because boon as is 34 and he's making his debut he was initially supposed to fight against zalgash jumagilov last you know or i guess not last year it's still 2023 at the time of the recording but earlier this year illness pulled out of the fight 13 and 6 record what i see from boon as though he does have a pressure grappling game and he has some hands on him too it's just i feel like bondar is pretty quick He's got a decent enough skill set where I think he can make it competitive with Bunez and win it a close one over the three rounds. I guess it's ultimately more so me not being sold on Bunez than me being so confident on Bondar. Because Bondar's got two L's in the UFC, 0-2 in the octagon. Carlos Hernandez lost, Malcolm Gordon lost, and he broke his arm bad in that Gordon fight. And then he gets a like headbutt slammed by Hernandez. He's had shit luck in the UFC. Bunez... On a winning streak, beat Yuma Horuchi by knockout. The power could be there if he throws heavy shots with Bondar. If he's able to get Bondar on his back, maybe the ground and pound. Split decision with Waskar Cruz in a real competitive back and forth fight where both guys ended up on top. Who was 13-9, and nine, not a great look. Lost to Jussier Formiga, win in the mix against Silander, and then a loss to uh, Bukayev and EV. Yeah, I think that Bondar edges him in a hard three rounds. I'll pick Bondar to upset him. Let's go with him. As far as the odds, Bondar's a little bit of an underdog at plus 130 here with Bunez at minus 160. I'm picking Bondar to pull it off. I think he could outwork him. I think he could mix in takedowns. And I think he could be competitive on the feet and even find shots striking. I'm going to pick the side of Bondar for the upset. Let's ride with him. Let's say that he snaps the losing skid in the UFC. He's working his ass off to get his first win. I think he can do it against the 13 and 6, 34 year old flyweight debuting Bunez. Next fight on the card, we got Preston Parsons 
versus Basil Hafez. I'm going with Basil Hafez. I have to take the absolute tank of a human being who in his UFC debut gave Jack Della Maddalena his toughest fight of his life. And J Jack Della now is fighting Gilbert Burns at UFC 299. Preston Parsons is a pretty strong wrestling type fighter. And I would say that Basil Hafez can match him in that wrestling department. But where he really exceeds him is just in the physicality and explosive power. Basil Hafez, I think, delivers a bomb to the chin of Preston Parsons and knocks him unconscious. Last time out, Preston Parsons split decision loss with Trevin Giles. Giles is okay, but something I want to note about the fight is Trevin Giles is nowhere near the physical specimen of Basil Hafez. He doesn't have the strength nor the explosiveness as, and power as Basil does. And then a win against Evan Elder, which I think aged pretty well. Elder's an up-and-coming guy at lightweight that a lot of people kind of compare to Dustin Poirier. And then Daniel Rodriguez knocked him out in the first round. I think that Basil Hafez can get a knockout here. I'm riding with him. He's a tank. I got to go with the tank. I got to go with the freak. I got to go with the specimen in this one. Looking at the odds for the fight, Basil Hafez, we know he's going to be the favorite, minus 155. Preston Parsons, the plus 135 underdog. I feel like Parsons is going to be hard to deal with in the first round. Maybe gives a little bit of trouble to Hafez with wrestling pressure early on. But I feel like Hafez is going to match it in the second, even the third. And I do think he finds the chin. I'm going to call Hafez by knockout. I'm picking him to get the win here. Basil Hafez for the W. KO. Next fight on the card, we got Marcus McGee versus Gaston Bolanos. I'm picking Marcus McGee to win. Gaston Bolanos comes from a you know kickboxing and Muay Thai background. He also fought in Bellator. Something to note about him is I think he's extremely suspect on the ground. Aaron Phillips, who Bolanos fought in his debut, had successful grappling exchanges with Bolanos, and I think Marcus McGee is a thousand times better. McGee actually has pretty slick stand-up too, and I think that in the striking department, I know Bolanos on paper, the kickboxing should win, but McGee's got some snap in his hands, and on the ground, I think McGee has way more weapons. So I'm going to go McGee. I think he wins by submission in this fight over Bolanos. Looking at the odds for the fight, McGee is a minus 305 favorite. Bolanos a plus 255 underdog. The odds are crazy wide. I'm curious what the sub prop is going to look like when they drop it. That makes a lot of sense to me, man. I know he knocked out JP Buys last time, but he submitted Journey Newsom with the rear naked Got some KOs. I mean, the power of Marcus McGee is real. And even though Bolanos has the kickboxing base, I got to say, I think the better hands are on McGee's side and definitely more hand speed and pop in his punches. And Bolanos didn't do well in Bellator either. Like, yeah, he got some wins, but lost to Daniel Carey, who was a bust in Bellator. And then uh, Solo Hatley, split decision, beat Daniel Carey in a rematch, which, yes, you know, it avenged the L, which is nice and all, but... Doesn't matter to me. I think Marcus McGee is the better fighter. Whereas Bolanos transitioning from kickboxing, looking so limited on the ground. I think Marcus McGee abuses him on the floor. So we're going McGee by sub. He should bully him. He should bully him on the ground. Next fight, ladies going after it. Yana Santos versus Norma Dumont in a weight class that I thought we were eliminating. But women's featherweight is still existing. And essentially, this should be for the women's featherweight title at this point. I'm picking Norma Dumont. I think this is a pretty clean fight. It makes a lot of sense. Like, let's look at let's look at something real quick. Norma Dumont, three fight win streak. Yana Santos, three fight losing streak. Polar opposites of their careers at this point. Corral Hosa got a split decision win over Santos last time. She lost to Holly Holm fight before that, and then she got knocked out by Irene Aldana in the fight before that. And then you look at the three wins, Chelsea Chandler win for Dumont, Corral Hoso win, and then a Danielle Wolf win. The Danielle Wolf fight, though, Danielle had one MMA fight, but still, normal one. And Danielle Wolf's a good boxer. I think Dumont is probably going to overwhelm Yana Santos with pressure. I think in the striking, she can touch her a bit too. I've always felt like Yana Santos is a little bit stiff in the stand-up. I know she's got a Muay Thai-based style, but she doesn't really have a ton of explosiveness. She's not very slick. She brings some clinch pressure and control, but I think Dumont exceeds the skill set when we're talking clinch and physical strength. 
Norma Dumont should get this one. She should win a decision here pretty cleanly. Looking at the odds, she's a minus 300 favorite. She should be a minus 300 favorite. We literally are in opposite career positions. I got Yana Santos on a three-fight losing streak, fighting Dumont on a three-fight win streak. So to me, it's Dumont with that upward momentum versus Yana Santos, who's just, you know, trying to hold on for the ride at this point. I don't think she's going to win here against Norma. So give me Dumont by a decision. I think she can honestly even outstrike Yana Santos, mixing in some pressure in the clinch and backing her up. She'll outmuscle her in the grappling spots, and Dumont should get her hand raised. Next fight on the card is our featured prelim. We got Andre Arlovsky versus Waldo Cortez Acosta. You guys know I be back in Waldo all the time. I really like Waldo's boxing. And I think that Andre Arlovsky is well past his best days. 22 losses, 44, nearly 45 years of age now. Whereas Waldo should win by KO. Waldo last time, he knocked out Lucas Dreschke. And I called the knockout in that fight. And I said Waldo is finally going to get a UFC KO. And I think that Waldo here with Arlovsky is in a similar spot. He's going to catch him. He's going to find the chin. Arlovsky needs to be perfect for three rounds. And he's dealing with a Waldo Cortez Acosta, who's a former pro boxer, pretty quick and athletic. And I think definitely at this point of their career is better. So Waldo's going to end up chinning Arlovsky. Last time out, Arlovsky, he got knocked out by Dante Mays. And then fight before that, Marcos Ogirio de Lima locked him up by sub. And he's been hurting some fights. Like unless he's fighting the real back back end of heavyweight, I think he's at risk of getting knocked out every time. And then you give him a good boxer like Waldo. I got Waldo by knockout. He finds the 45-year-old or nearly 45-year-old Arlovsky's chin for sure. Plus 300 for Arlovsky, minus 400 for Where's Waldo. I got a ride with Where's Waldo. I'm normally pretty confident in my Where's Waldo picks. And for the most part, I've been right Aside from the uh, Rogerio D. Lima fight, which he lost by decision, but he still gave a gutsy showing. Here with Arlovsky, he's going to knock him out. Waldo's going to sleep him. Arlovsky's he's so past his best days, but he's still very good. And, you know, he's got a very high, uh, you know, MMA fight IQ at this point. But there comes a time, and I got Waldo hammering Andre Arlovsky out of consciousness. So KO for Waldo in the featured prelim. Next fight is our main card opener. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. It's Jim Miller versus Gabriel Benitez. Jim Miller should win. Gabriel Benitez does have some excellent kicks, but I feel like Jim is going to knock him out. Jim Miller's got more power in his hands. I feel like Miller's going to put heavy pressure on Benitez and kind of start with the fast pace. And then if we talk grappling, I think Jim Miller is better on the ground too. If you look at Benitez, last time out, he was able to beat Charlie Antiveros, but Antiveros is not good. Even like in the slightest, even putting him in not good, he's, he's awful. He's awful as far as UFC level goes. David Onama knocked him out. Billy Q knocked him out. A win over Justin James, who's no longer with the promotion. Then Omar Morales, who's no longer with the promotion, beat him. Jim Miller last time out, knocked out Jesse Butler. Lost Alexander Hernandez, but he still went long with Hernandez. And you know what? Alexander Hernandez is a decent fighter. And he's also way younger than the side of Jim Miller, too. And it's not like Jim was absolutely... I mean, he was definitely lost. Like He clearly lost the fight. It didn't look like, oh, you should retire after that type of loss. Cowboy Cerrone win. Nicholas Moda knockout. Eric Gonzalez KO. Jim Miller's been finishing people. In his older age, Jim Miller's has gotten more violent. I'm going Jim Miller by knockout. But a club and sub wouldn't blow my mind here either. Looking at the odds, Jim Miller is sitting at plus 125 is the underdog. Gabe Benitez, minus 145. Give me Jim Miller all day. Why are we having him at an underdog here? I expected to see him as a minus 145, even minus 175 favorite. I thought he'd be a big favorite heading in. Instead, he's sitting at dog to take on Gabe Benitez, who I feel like has also been past his best days for a while. Yes, he kicks incredibly hard. But outside of those kicks, like, do I see Jim getting ripped apart with kicks from the outside? No, I actually see Jim probably countering the kicks and landing a knockout. So Jim Miller by KO is going to be my pick. And let's get Jim Miller on UFC 300. It has to happen. At 100, 200, and 300, 
That right there could be a send-off fight. He's beaten Mowgli Benitez here for sure. Good underdog. Next fight on the card is Phil Hawes versus Bruno Ferreira. I'm picking Bruno Ferreira. I'll tell you simply why. Phil Hawes is extremely chinny, and I also think that he has bad luck about him because he's been hanging around Dylan Dennis too much, and I feel like Bruno Ferreira is going to absolutely starch Phil. When Phil Hawes is on point, like up until he gets knocked out, normally he looks really fast and really good, but he's always had durability issues. I remember when Phil Hawes was on the come up, and it seemed like he was supposed to be this guy that was going to build into a future UFC star. There was comparisons to John Jones and whatnot. Like since he was three and oh, I remember the hype on him prior to being in the UFC loses for the ultimate fighter, uh, tryout and then loses on contender loses over in PFL eventually found his way to the UFC and he's very hot and cold. Unfortunately, he's just a hot and cold fighter. Great athletic specimen, but ultimately doesn't have the fight skill and here, I think Bruno Ferreira, too much punching power. He's going to catch him with like an overhand shot. Even if Phil Hawes is looking clean and beating up Bruno Ferreira, I think he's going to walk into a shot and get his light shut off. So give me Bruno for the KO. And Bruno's coming off of his first loss ever. He was knocked out by Nursultan Rizzi Boev. actually called that upset. A lot of people did not. But fight before that. He knocked out Gregory Rodriguez in the first round in his UFC debut, and that was a massive win for him on short notice. I think he can sleep Phil Hawes. Phil Hawes is a slight favorite, minus 115. Ferreira, minus 105. You can even find them at slight plus money, plus 105. I like the ever so slight underdog. I think this fight definitely under two and a half. Fight ends inside of the distance, and I think Bruno Ferreira's chinning Phil Hawes here. I'm excited for this matchup, man. Phil Hawes coming off that bad knockout too. Last time against Ikram Ali Askarov. The chin is too suspect. KO for Ferreira. Next fight on the card, it's Ketlin Vieira versus Macy Chiasson. I'm going to pick Ketlin Vieira to win a decision. I mean, Macy Chiasson's pretty long, has decent kickboxing skills. I think that she's actually pretty underrated in the clinch too. It's just Ketlin Vieira... I always have to have some faith in her. Aside from a controversial loss to Raquel Pennington, she'd be on a four-fight win streak. And then the Yana Santos loss, controversial. I mean, let's dig into this real quick. Ketlin Vieira has been screwed out of two decisions, in my opinion. One, two, three, four, five, six. Easily could be on a six-fight win streak after a brutal loss to Irene Aldana. Both these girls actually got knocked out by Aldana. But I think Ketlin Vieira here... She should shine. She should be able to meet, beat Macy Chiasson. I think she could hurt her in the striking. I just don't like calling a finish for either one of these ladies because they're not great finishers in all actuality. I mean, I think Ketlin Vieira's last finish is 2017. And then even if you look, like you dig into the recent fights for Macy Chiasson, she's not finishing anybody either. I think Vieira lands harder shots. I think she controls in the striking realm. I think in the clinch, Vieira is stronger. I can even see her getting on top and landing some ground and pound, but it'd be hard to call the finish here. I'll pick Vieira to get it done on the cards. Looking at the odds, Vieira is a minus 225 favorite, deserving tag. Macy Chiasson, plus 190. The comparisons for Vieira to Amanda Nunes, I feel like will always kind of be there. Definitely without the punching power though, not that level. But like, isn't it crazy? Ketlin Vieira, if not for some decisions going against her, where I personally thought she won, could be a 16 and one fighter and she could be fighting Myra Bueno Silva for the world championship right now. A win over Macy Chiasson for Ketlin Vieira, in my opinion, puts her real close to that title fight. She's definitely right up there as far as top female bantamweights. And I'd love to see her fight against Myra Bueno Silva. I mean, I really wouldn't want to watch back the Raquel Pennington fight. Be a lot of clinch work, kind of a clinch fest. But at the end of the day, if we have to get it, I think Vieira would be live to win it. But here, for sure, Ketlin Vieira, decision win. She's beaten Macy. Next fight on the card is our featured bout of the night. Ricky Simone versus Mario Batista. I'm picking Ricky Simone to win it. I think we have a lot of wrestling exchanges between these two and good scrambles, but I think the better wrestler is Ricky Simone and the stronger guy is Ricky Simone. I can see him taking Mario down, 
As far as in the stand-up, Simone's the harder and more explosive puncher, but I do think Batista will be better with kickboxing from distance, even though he doesn't have a long reach. I'm more thinking the kicks to the legs from the outside. One-inch reach differential favoring Ricky Simone, who's three inches shorter. Ultimately, I think Ricky Simone outworks him. It's a hard three rounds between two guys that I do think shine more so than anything else on the floor with dominant wrestling. But Ricky Simone can crack more than Mario Batista can. I'm going to say that there's more big moments for Ricky. He lands more significant strikes and he wins it on the judges' scorecards. Looking at the odds for this one, though. Ricky Simone is a minus 144 favorite with Mario Batista as a plus 124 underdog. I like Ricky Simone to win. Close money favorite, but he should be able to outwork Mario Batista. I'm not going to write him off after a knockout loss to Song Yedong, who's turned out to be a legit top contender. Mario was in a pretty back and forth fight with Damon Blackshear, who literally took the fight on a very short notice and had fought the week before and won by Twister. And Damon Blackshear had a couple grappling moments there. And I think Ricky Simone is a huge jump up the ladder. And I'm going to say Ricky Simone outworks him. I'm going three rounds, decision win, Ricky Simone. Next fight on the card, co-main event. Matthias Nicolau versus Manel Cop 2. Love this rematch. Absolutely love this rematch. You know, the first fight was a split decision loss. And we know that Nicolau is going to bring a little bit of threat with counter strikes, but also some threat with potentially uh, landing counter takedowns to neutralize the cop stand-up game. Now, as far as my pick, I'm picking Manel Cop to right the wrong. He lost the split decision last time. I think he can win now. Matthias Nicolau was viciously knocked out by Brandon Royval, but notoriously Nicolau is not an easy guy to hurt, right? Because he's such a cautious fighter. A lot of his game is built upon lateral movement, which as a fan, Maybe not your favorite because a lot of his strikes are going to be him countering the fighter trying to attack and him evading the onslaught. Manel Kopp is pretty slick and powerful. Now, last time out, though, for Manel Kopp, he was in a nail biter against Felipe Dos Santos, who came in on short notice and actually had some success against him. But I'm not going to let that derail my confidence in a totally different matchup against someone that he was competitive with before and also against someone that he has a two inch reach advantage over, which I like here. My question is not about, is Cop going to get it done? I'm predicting that he will. It's about how does he finish it? Does he go the distance with Matthias Nicolau and outpoint him in a hard three? No. I'm going to say he knocks him out. Manel Cop, I think, finds his punches here and gets a highlight reel knockout win. Nicolau was KO'd last time out. Makes it more of a possibility, in my mind, heading into this one against Manel Cop. Cop's got the much slicker boxing. And I think he can find that chin of Nicolau and flatline him. So give me Manel Cop with a highlight reel knockout. Maybe he steals the title shot away from the Albazi versus Moreno winner. I like the odds too. They're not crazy. Minus 190 for Cop. Matthias Nicolau plus 167. Granted, I don't love seeing Manel Cop who lost their first fight as a favorite. But what they've done recently, you can see why Manel Cop would be a favorite in a rematch against someone he lost a decision that he feels he won, nonetheless. Manel Cop feels he got that first fight. Competitive split. I think heading into this one, we have a more evolved Manel Cop. Nicolau, not saying he hasn't gotten better, but we know what we get from him. And I'm going to say Cop puts the hands on him. KO win for Manel. Next fight on the card is our main event of the evening. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. It's Magomed and Kalayev. Versus Johnny Walker to the rematch after their first fight ended with an illegal knee. No contest. <sighs> I have to pick Magomed and Kalayev, but I hate it. I don't want to pick Magomed and Kalayev. I am a Johnny Walker fan. And I hope that Johnny Walker starches Magomed and Kalayev in the first round. But if he does not, I think Ankalaev is going to find his range. I think Ankalaev is going to find his takedowns. And I think he's going to start beating Johnny Walker up. And I don't think Walker is going to survive five rounds of Magomed and Kalayev mixing in the takedowns. I think Ankalaev is going to wear on him in the grappling and then eventually ground and pound TKO him. Now, I hate that prediction. I really want to just pick Johnny Walker, but I'm not going to fanboy it out. The emotional side of picks for me is when I get myself into a lot of trouble. But I'm praying for, and we all should be, a Johnny Walker first round flying knee knockout that boots him right into the title picture. 
And I will love, I will love to see UFC 300, Johnny Walker, Alex Pereira. That's a dream scenario. How likely does it seem, though? Because Magomed Ankalaev is so technical. He's a southpaw. He's got pretty crisp stand-up. Doesn't do a great job with incredible kickers. But Johnny Walker, I mean, he's got solid Muay Thai, but I wouldn't call him an incredible kicker. I call him an incredibly dangerous guy with a freakish frame, explosiveness, athleticism, and legit knockout ability. Sure, he could catch Ankalaev, but Ankalaev is also never shown to be a chinny fighter. And it looked like Johnny Walker was starting to fall into that Magomed and Kalayev game plan when their last fight ended with the illegal knee. And I just don't know how long Johnny Walker can survive with Ankalaev. He needs to knock him out, I think, in the first round because I believe he will be worn down second, third round. I think KO, TKO, ground and pound from Magomed and Kalayev is what we're going to see. And I fucking hate it. Now, looking at Ankalaev's last couple, obviously, the Johnny Walker no contest draw with Jan Blahovic split decision even though Joe Rogan definitely felt that he win and he kind of coerced Jan Blahovic into admitting that he lost which I think was fucked a little bit and then before that he beat Anthony Smith which at this point a win over Anthony Smith has not I mean it's still impressive but it's, it's not what it was worth at the time and then Tiago Santos decision Volkan Ozdemir decision win Johnny Walker on the other side is a freak though Mago Benen Kalayev, no contest, right? Anthony Smith decision. He knocked out Paul Craig, Kute Laba submission, and then Jamal Hill flatlined him. We've definitely seen an evolved version of Johnny Walker. And he's got a freakish frame that could give Mago Benen Kalayev a ton of problems. And there's a possibility of him getting a finish win. And the odds are very wide that tell a story of a perfect fight for Ankalaev. Minus 450 for Ankalaev. Plus 350 for Walker. What I'll say about the betting odds is, yes, I could see the fight playing out in Ankalaev looking like a minus 450 favorite. But the danger factor of Johnny Walker, to me, would be the reason I don't think the line should be this wide. Minus 305 plus 255, like the Bolanos McGee odds, make a lot more sense. The minus 450 is disrespect as far as Ankalaev being that big of a favorite. And he opened at minus 550. Damn, Johnny Walker is getting no love from the books Heading into 2024 here. But I do think Ankalaev beats him. And I hate that I think he wins. So first main event of 2024, Ankalaev Walker. I hope I'm way wrong and I hope Johnny Walker knocks him out. But ultimately, I think Ankalaev neutralizes the chaotic Johnny Walker striking and wears him down and TKOs him on the ground. So Ankalaev to win the first main event of 2024. Those are the early predictions for UFC Vegas 84. I hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure you guys smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Turn the post notifications on. Make sure to share the video as well. I appreciate everybody for tuning in to the early prediction show. Keep your eyes peeled on the channel. I'm going to have content throughout the uh, UFC drought to keep you guys entertained. And I'm looking forward to the live streams and Q&As that I'll be dropping throughout the week as well. So daily content doesn't stop. It's just a different format. I'm entering the news sphere, and then I'll be dropping the per usual live streams as always. I appreciate everybody's support. Let me know what you thought of the picks in the comments, and if you have nothing to say in the comments, but you just enjoyed the content, as always, drop a W in the chat to boost the algorithm for your boy. Much love, my people, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace.